Hello everyone, my name is Chris He, and for my EC492 uh, final report and video, I'll be discussing the topic of induction motors as generators in low cost micro hydro schemes. So, to start off, we're going to ask the question why micro hydro? Um, there are a few reasons for this. Um, first of all, there's an ever increasing demand for electricity around the world. People want to have TVs have cell phones lighting at night, uh, radio, etc. Um, they've become dependent on refrigeration for a lot of their food, and it provides them with a food source for longer than they would normally be able to um, have. And generally, in a third world setting, this would mean burning a lot of diesel. To give you a bit of background, there are over 2 billion people in developing countries who have no access to electricity and over 1.7 billion who rely on diesel for their power generation. Um, however, most of these people in third world countries live in villages that are near water sources for food or um, hygiene or whatnot, which gives a great opportunity for clean, green energy. What we have in this slide is a picture of a typical microhydro system. Uh, we can see the major components. Uh, the intake, located at the highest point of elevation, uh, siphons some water off the creek, but it's meant to survive um, if the creek level was to increase rapidly or there's heavy rain flow, it shouldn't be uh, washed away, so it should be able to survive um, uh, sudden changes in flow. Uh, and then flow, the water flows down the canal into the floor bay, which acts as a buffer, as well as provides some uh, filtering and a settling pond for um, debris to not enter the hydro intake. The water then flows down the penstock and becomes pressurized and the amount of energy or, um, stored is equal to the flow times the head which is the vertical distance between the intake and the powerhouse. Uh, in the powerhouse is where you actually have the turbine and the generator as well as all the associated controls and at the, exiting the powerhouse is a low pressure stream of water mostly depleted of its kinetic energy. So for the purpose of this report, we're going to focus on the squirrel cage induction motor, which is the most common type of induction motor found used all around the world in industrial applications. Uh, it's a simple, robust, reliable design. It's been proven and it's used. It accounts for some huge percentage of the world's energy uh, consumption. And the only maintenance item that you actually have to worry about on this is typically the bearing, assuming it hasn't been um, stressed too hard and there's no voltage stress or whatnot. It's a very low maintenance item. Um, there's a little drawing here of a typical induction motor. You can see that there's actually no physical connection between, or electrical connection rather, between the stator and the rotor. Um, all the energy is coupled uh, magnetically between the stator and rotor through the air gap. So for those of you in UBC who have taken EC373, this should look familiar to you, and it's the electrical model for the induction motor. R1 and X1 represent the stator uh, resistance and reactance. RC represents the core losses in the motion, or, uh, machine. Uh, XM represents the magnetizing inductance. And A squared X2, R2 prime, and R2 prime over S represent the rotor parameters, where R2 prime over S uh, is our uh, parameter of interest because that represents the mechanical power delivered to the load. Now induction motors want to run at a synchronous speed which is dictated by the supply frequency. Um, they will however not actually run at this frequency. Um, they'll run a little bit slower uh, depending on the load and how much torque there is applied to the motor. So the difference between the rotating electric field speed and the speed of the rotor is called the slip. Uh, we can calculate it as the synchronous speed minus the rotor's actual speed divided by the synchronous speed. And it is generally proportional to torque when you're operating in the normal operating band of the motor. <clears throat> and this can be a positive or a negative number. So if we have a slip in the opposite direction to normal motoring mode, it means we are generating, we are converting mechanical power to electrical power. We can see a nice diagram here of the positive and negative torque profile 
And the, the region that we are interested in is on the far right, which is the generating region, where you'll have a negative slip. Uh, as an example, let's consider a 4 pole 60 hertz machine, which produces 100% of its load current at a slip of 5%. Uh, our synchronous speed is 1800 RPM using the formula given before. So what speed would we need to drive it to produce full load current? We can calculate it using the formulas presented. And find that our required rotor speed is 1890 RPM. So our prime mover, the turbine or water wheel, whatever it may be, will have to spin it at about 1890 RPM to produce the full rated power. Now we may be wondering, can we just spin the motor at the required speed, 1890 RPM, and hope that it produces power? The answer is, well, no. We need to provide magnetizing current, and we can't do that if we're just spinning the motor. It needs a source. Uh, since we don't have the grid, we're going to need to provide the current some other way. During normal operation, we'd have the grid supply, which would provide both active and reactive power where the active power is used to produce the torque and the reactive power is used to magnetize the machine. But since we won't have a grid supply in a lot of these isolated microhydro setups, we can provide the necessary reactive power from a bank of capacitors. We will, however, need to require or calculate the required capacitance based on the motor's ratings and the anticipated load. In the example here, we can see that we're presented with a 4 pole, 2.2 kilowatt, 50 hertz, 415 volt three phase motor, draws a current of 3.5 amps at its rated uh, parameters. Um, without going through the calculations, uh, we can see how we calculate the required reactants and therefore the required capacitance for this particular motor setup to be used as a generator. Now given the proper capacitive bank added to a induction motor and the proper speed, we can generate electrical power, but it will be three phase power. However, most residential loads are single phase. So how do we solve this? We can use what we call the C to C capacitor connection. Here we can see the C to C connection. Um, instead of supplying one capacitor to each phase of the motor, we apply one across the load phase and two across, or two times the capacitance across the phase directly uh, lagging it. So we'll now move on to the practical implementation of induction motors as generators. Um, things like what kind of machines are you looking for? Um, how can we operate them with constant load and why should we? What we can do with an electronic load controller for a constant load operation. And we'll do a brief look at some power transmission topics. Okay, so for machine selection, we're going to want to choose a three phase machine. They have ratings much higher than single phase and they're much more common. You're going to want high efficiency. Um, this will reduce the copper losses inside. Uh, it should have a continuous power rating higher than the needed rating for your anticipated load. Uh, this is because when they're operating in generating mode, uh, the stresses are a bit higher and the core may be a little bit more susceptible to saturation. Um, and then whatever type of enclosure you need will depend on the installation, but it may need to be waterproof, dustproof, totally enclosed, fan ventilated, etc. So what is constant load operation? Well, basically, it means we're running the motor at a fixed power output. And if we operate it like this, due to the characteristics of the induction motor, the voltage and frequency will stay relatively constant, which is desirable for a generator. However, the customer loads will vary, and people are going to want to change their loads. People are going to want to have the fridge come off and on, fans on and off, TV, etc. So how do we maintain a constant load at the generator to ensure that the voltage and frequency remain generally fixed? We can use an electronic load controller. Um, basically, it switches a dummy load across the generator output to maintain a constant load, even when the customer load drops. Uh, it senses the voltage and switches across the dump load or the dummy load as necessary to keep the load relatively constant. And the dummy load is often resistive and you can use it for heating water or heating an area, um, could be lights, any sort of resistive load. 
Here's the basic drawing of a super simple electronic load controller. We rectify the single phase output of the machine and switch the resistive load across it proportional to how much um, sensed load there is on the line. And this way we should be able to regulate the voltage and frequency by maintaining a constant load on the generator. The waveform at the bottom shows the voltage across the dummy load or ballast being switched multiple times per cycle. For those of you who have taken power courses, you'll be familiar with the problem of transmitting power over larger distances. Um, in, in this case, it's where you have a rural village, it's quite likely that the generator could be located for far enough away from the village that the losses will be considerable. If you were to use a regular distribution voltage of 120 or 240, the losses will become basically unacceptable at power levels over a few hundred watts. The solution to this, of course, is to use a step-up and step-down transformer. These can be found surplus in a lot of different places, or they can be custom-made for particular applications. If we were to, say, consider using a 240 to 2.4 kV transformer, this can be custom-wound or found. Um, we can reduce the losses by a factor of 1 over 100 in terms of um, losses in the copper. To conclude, we have presented that the induction motors are low cost, rugged, and very simple to use as generators. They can be found worldwide and they are robust and well suited for the application. We can get single phase power from a three phase machine by proper selection of a capacitor bank and proper connection in the C2C configuration. We can use a basic electronic load controller to operate a constant load to fix the output voltage and frequency. And we can use a transformer to reduce copper losses in transmission over longer distances. And that concludes the presentation. I'd like to thank you for your time. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them below in the comment section. Thank you.